Well, I must admit, as a rather undistinguished alumni of the college, I'm rather daunted by facing uh, members of the college because I think my academic career, I was a geographer, so we, we know what level I was at, but actually I only got two-thirds of a pass degree, so which has rather distinguished me. Um, this is where I began my photographic career at Oxford. I've been a professional photographer all my life. And this project grew out of an idea eight years ago. I met a, a, a man, a very distinguished military historian, Professor Richard Holmes, sadly now dead. And we conceived the idea of a project um, on the First World War. The title, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace, is very deliberate. These are fields where a battle took place. They're not battlefields. Battlefield is where there are bodies and the bits and pieces lying around. These are fields where a battle took place. And today, a hundred years later, we thought it was an appropriate to take a new look at the First World War. And this project has now, we originally it was going to be a book, it has now grown, we thought that was a bit too narrow, and it has now grown into what has been so far this year the two largest photographic exhibitions in Europe open to the public in a public place. These are not in museums or galleries. These are designed as a street exhibition so that anybody can see it. The idea being that if you put it in a museum, it immediately becomes elitist. And we wanted to open this up to the maximum audience. We had it in Paris on the railings of the Jardin du Luxembourg around the French Senate. Currently, it is in St. James's Park, um, which we were given. I actually just shows how this country still runs. When we asked the Royal Parks for permission, they said, how many, how many people do you expect? We said, we reckon about 900,000. They said, that's 1.8 million pounds, please. Two pounds a head is what they want. I muttered about this to a friend of mine who said, don't worry, I'm having lunch with the owner's secretary next week. I said, what do you mean? He said, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Ten days later, I get a phone call from the Royal Park saying, we would love to have your exhibition. God bless you, ma'am. Um, anyway, it's open. We reckon it, they reckon it's been seen by about 1.1 million people, so I'm feeling pretty chuffed. The only thing is, it's free to view, so it's a very bad business model. But how this ex what I want to do is to literally go through most of it, or a part of it, and perhaps put over some of the history of the First World War to try and put in context what it is that we're going to be commemorating over the next four years. Because the government has given no thought to this. All they've said is they think that all commemoration should be non-national. Which I think by that they mean local. But, you know. Anyway, um, Fields of Battle, Lands of Peace, this is the exhibition and, um, which was conceived. Really, the First World War... When it broke out, you had your central states there, the western front involved here, you have the eastern front here, and what I'm going to show you are pictures of all the theatres of war except for Mesopotamia, uh, which is, of course, modern Iraq, where I just I chickened out of that. I was helped greatly by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission because they actually asked me to shoot their centenary book, which meant I was able to go to a lot of exotic places which I can otherwise not have got to. The Western Front starts here, up in the channel, and this is basically what it was like in 1914-15 when the first war of movement slowed down. Because the, first, the beginning of the First World War was a traditional war, a war of movement, where generals were jockeying for position, trying to get their men into position where they could fight a battle. And of course we have this great thing of the Schlieffen Plan, where the Germans basically decided they, if they were going to fight the French and the Russians, which they had to do because of the alliance that was in place, they reckoned the Russians were going to take time to mobilise, therefore they could get at the French first, and what they had to do was to knock the French out of the war, then they could concentrate on the Russians. They reckoned they could take the French out in 40 days, and their plan was simply to invade through Belgium, down here, sweep down, round past Paris, and basically wrap up the French, and that was their plan. So the beginning of the First World War, the walk that Terry has done in his book, is basically the Germans sweeping down, down here, to try and take Paris. The Schlieffen Plan. So this is, in fact, the Schlieffen Plan, here we are, right. The Germans have planned for this. This is a German Schlieffen Plan railway station. It's actually in what is now France in Lorraine, but this station was designed 
purely for military purposes. We could not have the First World War today. Forget about the media. We couldn't map run the First World War today for the simple reason we don't have the train system. The train system in the First World War was extraordinary. 500 trains crossed the Rhine in one day as the Germans mobilized. Incredible performance. They were capable of moving huge numbers of men. Um, and this particular station, as you can see, wide platform and everything else. Now, we heard earlier on about Professor Edgeworth and his bet about uh, the 50,000 men. Well, this is roughly where he lost his bet. Because this is the 22nd of August, the Bois de Rossignol on the French-Belgian border. The French lost 11,000 men killed in this wood. On the same day, they lost about 40,000 men in one day. We talk about the 20,000 men on the Somme on the first day. The French losses at the beginning of August and September were unbelievable. By the end of September, 350,000 men dead. That's three times the size of the army that we sent to France. So you can begin to get a scale. The problem was that this was a whole new kind of warfare. Wars before had been fought on a one-day basis. At the end of the day, whoever held the ground had won the battle. Here we've got a battle with a war where back people are moving. This is where we first come into the war, Mons. This is the cemetery of saint symphorien They're German crosses or German headstones. The Germans buried the British dead after the Battle of Mons on August the 23rd. It's a very beautiful cemetery. It contains both German and British soldiers. And ironically, it actually contains the first British soldier killed by the enemy. It's buried here. And also the last Allied soldier to be killed in enemy action is buried here. So this cemetery, if you like, comes full circle. Extraordinary place. The invasion of France was held down on the Marne, uh, to just to the south and east of Paris, uh, what the French would call the miracle of the Marne. Um, massive number of men, 1.2 million men were involved in this battle. Extraordinary. It is actually, I think, the most important battle of the First World War. Because although it was, in, it, because it was inconclusive, it caused the Germans to retreat, and because it was inclusive, inconclusive it meant that the war was going to go on the German plan of taking France out in 40 days had failed which meant they were now committed to prolonged warfare they had the French on one front and the Russians on the other so the Germans had failed in their basic objective by the 10th of September when they had to retreat from the Marne without taking Paris Failed. This is where it happened. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, the Russians have actually mobilized faster than the Germans thought they would do, and there are huge monolithic battles at Tannenberg and the Masurian Lakes, and incredible numbers of men. The, the, the Russians lose 125,000 men taken prisoner. The British expeditionary force is only 120,000. So extraordinary numbers. The Germans are very scared by the Russians because they know the Russians have got about two and a half million men that they can mobilize. So they're a huge monster. The Belgians, meanwhile, who have been invaded, the King Albert has actually stayed in the country, and what the Belgians do is they flood large part of northern Flanders. They open the tidal gates at high tide, and they let the sea in, and they inundate the valley of the, of the Isère, and it forms a barrier which the Germans cannot pass. King Albert and his queen Elizabeth uh, stay in Belgium, virtually within range of guns, and there's actually a lovely story about a young uh, British Royal Engineer officer who's on his way to his headquarters, and he passes a couple of pretty nurses. So um, he, takes, he fancies one of them, and he starts chatting her up, and you know, it's rather nice, sort of a pretty, he's a young man away from home, talking to a pretty girl, and a couple of days later, he's taken on one side and told, um, mm, just stop that, you're chatting up the Queen of the Belgians. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on the east of France, up in the Vosges Mountains, 
The Germans are fighting the French, the French, because this was actually, don't forget, that at the beginning of the First World War, what is now Eastern France was actually Germany. It was Alsace and Lorraine, which France had lost in 1870 in the Franco-Prussian War, and they wanted, therefore, to recapture it. And I have a friend in Alsace, his great-grandfather changed nationality four times without even leaving his village. So <laughs> it was a really complicated thing. Um, and uh, this is a, a battlefield, a unique place, because what happened was when the, after the battle was over, one of the Germans went around wherever a soldier had, was, had been killed, he just carved a name, or in fact it was a German soldier, actually carved it into the, into the rock. And you can go there to this day, and you can literally follow the course of a battlefield. You see this guy behind the rock here, probably pop, pokes his head up over the top and gets shot from the summit of the, of the mountain. We were talking about trenches and trench structure. This is a typical First World War trench. You can see the zigzag line that, that Jeremy was talking about to stop um, a shell blast going all the way along it. And uh, this, is a, this is actually a front line, British front line trench. And this is what's known as a communication trench. This is the trench that goes to the back. Uh, and that's what people come in. Um, bear in mind, you know, you've probably all seen Blackadder. Very funny, bloody bad history. It really is. Um, the fact of the matter is the average British soldier would actually only spend five days a month actually in the firing line. The rest of the time, he would be working, he'd be, he might be carrying supplies up and things like that, but as an actual front-line soldier, it's on average five days of the month. Obviously, in times of stress, like the Battle of the Somme, it would be longer, but that generally there was that. And in fact, it's worth noting that a battalion in the line about 10 miles north of the Somme during the month of July 26, 1916, suffered a total of eight men wounded in a month. That was all. So you could have vast activity going on in one place, and just a few miles away, it would be tranquil, and the men would just literally be resting. By the end of 1914, the British Expeditionary Force had ceased to exist. Um, as you heard, Kitchener was rebuilding, it was building a new army, but it was taking time to do, and we began to look for solutions. How can we break this at the on pass on the Western Front? We've now got this trench line which has grown up, we can't move, what is going to happen? So we did a landing in Gallipoli. And this is a landing on Hellas, and this is where a ship called the SS Clyde came in, and the description, as the men came, they landed on these rocks here, and as they tried to get onto the beach here, the Turks in this fort massacred them. And the descriptions are that, in fact, the blood, the, the, this water was stained blood red for 50 metres out. About 500 men died on this piece of rock. Horrendous losses. No one had yet come to terms with how you handle the machine gun or how you handle the fighting against the machine gun. It's about 500 rounds a minute. Um, very, very awkward, and it's something which we can accuse the generals of being stupid, but they were desperately trying to think of new ways the whole time. And again, this is uh, Gallipoli, and this is one of the landing craft which is, is still there, and this is what they call the Lancashire landing. Uh, they won six VCs before breakfast, getting onto this beach, because the Turks were basically sitting up on this hill, and the naval bombardment had failed to, to, to dislodge them. The whole of the Gallipoli campaign was totally misguided, and it is, I think, sadly, one of the great blots on Winston Churchill's discussion. He, he did not do well in his promotion of the Gallipoli campaign. Um, towards the end of 1915, um, the British Army are beginning to, they've now got a lot of reservists that are in the line, and uh, the French are under pressure in Artois, and they asked the British to launch an attack um, at a place called Luz, Luz en Gaville, uh, which is near, near Lens. The French had a major problem because the German invasion of France had taken about 40% of their coal reserves, um, and they were very largely dependent upon the British uh, for, for their coal, for their, their industry, and um, the, in fact, these are the, the, what were known as the, the two crassiers, um, which are the cold two spoil heaps. They were there on the day of the battle. This football is 
the London Irish football. <laughs> this football, I, my, it's, I, my father served with him in, in the Second World War, and I remember being shown as a small boy, being shown a football, and, um, which I was told had been kicked into action. It is not the Christmas truce football. Let's forget about the Christmas truce. The Christmas truce football match almost certainly did not exist. People probably kicked a football about, but you bet your bottom dollar that next Christmas, when Prince William drops a football and David Beckham kicks it off, it will become part of history. It's not. No one has yet proved there was an actual match. There was probably a kickback. But the London Irish football, this was a little London territorial regiment, never been in action before, and at 7.30 in the morning, they got out of the trench and they kicked that football into action. Um, Patrick McGill, a well-known Irish poet and writer known as the Navi Poet, he was there on the day as a stretcher bearer and he wrote very dramatically about this action and you can actually see the tears in it and the holes in it from the action. And I went to see this football in it and it lives in a box in Camberwell and I said, can I please take it back to the, to the, to the, to the battlefield? And they said, I see no reason why not. And when I tell that story to museum curators, they go, White. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, I mean, it is, it's an incredible relic. I think of all the relics of the First World War, this has got to be one of the greatest. The thought that young men took that football and attacked machine guns, kicking that as they went. I think it says a lot about their spirit and their attitude to the war in those days. It's an attitude that we can't even begin, I think, to understand. But the London Irish football. At the same time, we now get involved in Greece, in Thessaloniki, um, in Doran, in fact, the Oxen Bucks, our local county regiment, Oxen Bucks, were here. 30% um, of casualties were to malaria. Um, and I can tell you, taking this photograph, those mosquitoes are still there. <laughs> um, it cost me a good cigar to get, to, I mean, it really is horrendous that you're looking up at Bulgaria. But again, it's one of these little sideshows of uh, the First World War which we got involved in, because the, the whole global strategy of the First World War is very confused, we got dragged into things, and I think in the next four years we should remember that it is not just the Great War, it is the First World War, and we, te we Brits tend to forget that, we really do, and I think it's something very important when... when when the, a government announcement was made about the their plans for commemoration of the First World War, they never once used the word Commonwealth. And I think that's a great tragedy and a real disservice. Um, back to the Western Front, we hear uh, this is how it has stabilised um, in this period. So it's in late 1915. And what is happening is, if you look down here, you'll see Verdun. And early in 1916, the Germans launch a major offensive down here in Verdun. And their idea is basically that the French are going to defend that, and they'll defend it at all costs, and the Germans think they're just going to kill the French army off. And this is what they do. They launch their attack in February of 1916, and the French slog it out um, with the Germans. Uh, this is a very, for the French, this is sacred ground. This is a man called Colonel Drion, this is command post. Um, and he held this post for 24 hours with 1,000 men against an attacking force of about 15,000 Germans. Drion himself was killed, and out of his 1,200 men, about 120 survived. But for the French, it bought them time, and Verdun became a, back, a war within a war. It really did. To give you an idea of the kind of firepower that the Germans were using, this is believed to be the damage wrought by a 420 millimeter howitzer. 420 millimeters. I mean, that's a big piece of kit. And this is about 10 inches thick. And it's just blown apart. I mean, the force and ferocity of artillery fire in the First World War is something very hard to imagine. This is the battlefield at Verdun. And we all have visions of men fighting from trenches. As the war went on, increasingly, you would use a trench to get up to the front line, but your front line would then consist of shell holes like this. 
And that was how you fight your war. Just clump, you know, just little groups of you hunkered down in those holes. And increasingly, it would be very difficult to actually ascertain where your front line was. And there are lots of accounts of soldiers getting intermingled. Actually, Germans and French, Germans and British, actually getting mixed up in shell holes and having to sort themselves out. The French losses at Verdun were massive. They lost over a quarter of a million men, and they were desperate for the British to take some pressure. <clears throat> now bear in mind that in 1914 the BEF had gone to war. By the end of 1914 it had largely ceased to exist. Kitchener's men, as you heard, all being busily recruited and trained with poor equipment. The, the thing they lacked were men to train them because the men that could have trained them had already gone to France and disappeared. So the problem you then have is training up the army. And it took us 18 months, really, to put Kitchener's army into the battlefield, um, which is what we had to do. Um, and we did it on the Somme. Um, Haig did not actually want to fight here. He didn't think it was the best place to be. But basically the French said, no, you've got to support us. And Haig was put under political pressure. Haig gets a lot of stick from a lot of people, but the fact of the matter is that, that it was the politicians who said to Haig, this is where you've got to fight. And basically this was the front line, and these were all the objectives of the first day. And as we now know, the Somme was a total disaster. The only bit where it really succeeded was down here, uh, right down at the bottom, uh, where in fact the French were also involved in attacking at this particular point, and French artillery. And the French army, because they'd been fighting at Verdun for five months, we had worked out their tactics. We Brits had not done that, so we basically went into the attack after a week's very heavy bombardment of German positions. We didn't realize how deep the dugouts were. It's quite simply what happened. Some of the dugouts were 40 feet deep. Um, and the Germans literally, after the bombardment, they emerged. And to this day, the Somme is this extraordinary area. It's quite depopulated. Uh, this is what they call the iron harvest. Um, this is a farmer just plowing his field, picking up these shells, and he just moves them to the side of his field. And um, if this was in Britain, there'd be an exclusion zone of half a mile. <laughs> um, we put a flashing blue lights. Um, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the short story writer H.H. H. Munro, known as Saki. Right, Saki was killed very close to here, and his last words are reputed to be, put that bloody cigarette out. <laughs> um, this is Loch Nagar Crater. This is one of the craters that was blown up under the German lines. Basically what would have happened is that a tunnel was dug which came in from about half a mile away. And this tunnel would have been about four foot high and two foot wide. And it would have been dug under, into this position and then filled with explosive. And then what you just did, you just literally blew it up. Um, and hopefully taking your judgment. In fact, the attack at this point wasn't successful, but I won't go into that because it gets, yeah, we, we are a bit short of time. But this is one of the big, you know, one of the big visual indications that you've got of the First World War still there um, on the French landscape. But as you can see, the rest of it has basically, farming has taken it over. Um, you know, time and nature has eradicated a lot of the traces of the First World War. Though interestingly enough, you can see here, this white line, in fact, is of an old trench. So you can still see the trench line sometimes from the chalk, that's this underlying chalk that's been disturbed. This if any of you have seen the Malins film of the Somme, there's a shot taken in a sunken lane, uh, which is up here. And basically, this is uh, typical of the first day of the Somme, because the British were attacking from here in this direction to a, a German strong point over here. And the camera position is on a place known as Hawthorne Crater, which was another one of those mines that the British blew, but they blew up the German lines. But for some reason, which is still not known, it was blown up 10 minutes before the attack went in. And in those 10 minutes, the Germans got back into the, into the crater, 
And this camera, this position, camera position, is from where the German machine gunners were sitting as the Lancashire Fusiliers marched in a neat line across this field. And that is where they lie in the cemetery at Beaumont Hall, the Lancashire Fusiliers. This photograph is made of one of probably the most easily accessible battlefield with extensive trench systems on the Western Front, it's a place called Beaumont Hamel. It's Newfoundland Park. It's the memorial to the Newfoundlanders who died here. Uh, 750 went into action, and about 38 of them survived the day. Um, the importance of this picture is that in the First World War, the only information that you had about about your opponent was what you obtained from aerial photography. You knew nothing about your enemy behind this front line unless you had aerial photographs and it was out of photography, the need to get photographs like this that aerial combat in the First World War was born. <coughs> because basically what you needed to do is you needed to have a scout plane with too many, one flying it, one taking pictures on a big plate camera which you held over the side so you were flying in a slow, straight line, and the enemy wanted to shoot you down, and that is how aerial combat began in the First World War. And it was largely, we all think of people going up and having dogfights, but basically it was all about getting intelligence about your enemy's position. Now, one of the great forgotten battlefields of the First World War is the sea. The beginning of the war, the Royal Navy ruled supreme. It had a basic thumb rule, rule of thumb, which was it had to be twice the size of any other two navies. And that's what we managed to succeed. We go into the First World War uh, with this magnificent navy, which has extended the British, protected the British Empire around the globe, and that's its purpose. The only trouble was that um, on, um, sorry, I'm just trying to get the date, 22nd of September, 1914, reality struck. Um, submarine, German submarine U-9 torpedoed one, two, three British cruisers in the space of an hour in the English Channel. Um, and uh, there was a, a, a poor devil called Wenman Wickham Musgrave who actually set up an extraordinary record of being torpedoed three times in one day. Uh, he must have thought someone had really got it in for him. Um, but the Royal Navy then began, realised the submarine was this huge threat. And so if you look at the history of the naval warfare, during the First World War, it is this balance of the Royal Navy trying to keep the Germans blockaded, the Germans trying to provoke our North Sea Fleet to come out and fight a battle, and the British Navy trying to avoid this major battle in case they sailed into submarines and minefields. The Battle of Jutland was in inconclusive, but as someone once said, the thing about it was that Jellicoe was the one man who could lose the war in a day. Because if the Royal Navy had been destroyed, we would have been incredibly vulnerable and to blockade action by submarines, just as we were in the Second World War. Now, this picture really basically, the point behind this is that the beginning of 1917, we'd fought the bloody Battle of the Somme. German casualties had been just as heavy as the British. We remember it as a disaster. The Germans would say, actually, it is where the German army lost a huge number of men, and the Germans realized they could not win the war on land alone. They had to win the war at sea. The only way they could do it was by declaring unconditional submarine warfare, i.e. any ship sailing towards Britain could be sunk. And they declared that in January 1917, knowing full well it would bring the Americans into the war. They knew that, but they persisted because they calculated that if they could sink 500,000 tons of ships a month for six months, they would starve Britain out. The beginning of May 1917, we had five weeks 
of wheat left in the country and 25% of all ships that sailed for Britain in that month were sunk by submarines. So we have to bear in mind, we all talk about the Somme and Passion Day and all these other places, but the fact is that if the war at sea had not been won in 1917, we would have lost the war, almost certainly, by the end of 1917. What happened was that at the end of June, June 1917, they introduced a convoy system and our losses, shipping losses dropped dramatically at the same time as the Americans were building a lot more ships. But it is a forgotten battlefield, it's a very lonely battlefield for those sailors and if you ever go to, if any of you are going to go to look at the Tower of London at the Poppies, do go up Tower Hill and look at the Merchant Seaman Memorial because it's very seldom visited. But there are men who actually uh, had great importance, and in fact, one merchant sea captain was actually awarded the Victoria Cross. Now, those of you who know anything about medals, you are, can only receive a Victoria Cross if you are in the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, or Flying Corps, or the Army. Merchant seamen do not get the Victoria Cross, but this particular captain fought a very brave action. He was a captain for P&O, and when King George heard about it, he said, this is nonsense. We will make him, we will commission him into the Royal Navy posthumously. So they made him a, a lieutenant in the Royal Navy posthumously, and they said, right, now we can give him a Victoria Cross. <laughs> um, I said earlier on about we, we Brits tend to be a bit British centric. The French, we have to bear in mind that during the First World War, the Western Front, which is the, in France, which is 450 miles long, the longest piece of land that we ever held was 110 miles. The French always held the rest of it, and they were there for the long haul. And this is near Soissons. This is the chapel of Père Doncourt. Uh, Soissons is a limestone ridge which was used for providing building stone for Paris during the medieval times. And the best stone came from underground, where it hadn't been destroyed by water and frost action. So they actually had caves. And this is a cave which was um, carved by the Poilu, the French soldiers, the chapel, and these steps actually go up into the front line. It's an extraordinary place, and they held this for four years. Um, the Chemin des Dames, which was uh, uh, where in 1917, Nivelle launched, a uh, French general launched an offensive which did not succeed, but um, huge casualties, and this is where the French army actually, very interesting, we Brits would always say, ah, oh, they mutinied, they were useless. Actually, what most of the French did was they said, well, actually, we're not going to attack, but we're not going to, go, we're not going to move. We're not, we're not going to give up the sacred soil to the invader, but don't tell us to attack. We're not going to do that. We're fed up with it. And at this particular point, they started their attack on April the 4th. The French front line was just about here. And they actually took the position where I, this photograph is taken from on June the 15th. So when British military historians tell you, oh, the French mutinied, maybe they did, and maybe some units were, were, were reluctant, but some of the units still kept fighting. So it's an area of history that we need to look at again. Now, I was saying about the submarines and the threat they posed, and it was decided that one of the things they wanted to do was actually to take out the coastal ports where the submarines were sailing from, places like Zeebrugge and Ostend. And the Ute salient, which became known as Passchendaele, this was one of the battles that was fought deliberately to try and help eradicate that submarine uh, threat. The Ute salient, if there's any soil anywhere on Europe which can be called British, this is it. Because we were here for four whole years, and the salient's a lousy place to be if you're a soldier, because this is it, you're down here, and around here, this is a sort of, if you like, a, a, a ridge, low ridge of hills. And if you stood here in the center of Yeep for four whole years, you were never more than four miles away from an enemy gun on effectively three sides. So you were well within range, and by the end of the war, Yeep was totally flattened. But this is the scene of what became known as the Battle of Passchendaele, it started off with one of the most successful battles in the First World War, which is the Battle of Messine, where again, we actually, this is the ridge along here which we wanted to take, so what we did was we drilled a, a series of 
tunnels in and under the ridge, and we put in 21 mines. And uh, these mines, they were blown in uh, <coughs> June of, of 1917. It was a total of 450 tons of high explosive. It was the biggest man-made explosion prior to the nuclear age. They reckon 10,000 men, 10,000 Germans died in the space of about 30 seconds. So it gives you an idea of the scale of this. Um, and this photograph is basically, there's a description about the pillars of fire rising up out of the earth. And um, I was fortunate that uh, I got a, a, um, a rainbow just at the right moment. But this is the Battle of Messie, which was very successful. But to give you an idea of the force of these mines, that is a crater, a hundred year old crater. And there's three of them in this particular area. But that gives you an idea of the scale of devastation that was wrought um, by these mines. Passchendaele became renowned for its mud. What happened was that the attack was launched at, uh, in, in July. The weather was good. We made ground, and then it changed. And Passchendaele, which is this intensive farming area, very low. Flanders does mean wet ground. And the drainage had been destroyed by shell fire. And it just became an absolute quagmire. It really did. And again, you've got the iron harvest. In this particular part of Belgium, they pick up about 200 tons of munitions a year to this day. Um, it is extraordinary. And the guys just drive around in little pickup trucks with sandbags in the back, and they'll come along, and they'll just pick this up, and put it in the back of the pickup truck, and drive on to the next one. It is a quite extraordinary sight. And if you drive around there during the winter months, you'll see these shells. They put them, the farmers will just put them on, road, on, on, on roadside corners. They'll put them by um, telegraph poles, just anywhere that's an obvious place. And the bomb squad come along and pick them up. It's very still part of life. Um, this picture um, is to show, basically, this is taken from a place called Ducci Farm, and it's looking up towards the Passchendaele Ridge. Those of you who've known there, this is in fact Tynecott Cemetery here, and you can just see the Cross of Sacrifice. This is the biggest cemetery, Wargrave Cemetery, British Wargrave Cemetery in the world. This is looking, this is the distance that they actually got in a period of four months, from where I'm standing to this line of trees at the back. So it just shows you the progress of you can see this low rolling landscape. This is Tynecott Cemetery itself. Um, and um, 12,000 men are buried here, and another 34,000 um, on a memorial uh, for men who've got no known graves. And King George came here in 1922 and he said, I have many times asked myself whether there can be more potent advocates of peace upon earth through the years to come than this mass multitude of silent witnesses to the desolation of the world. Towards the end of 1917, we launched our first major tank attack. Um, and they actually came out of this woods down here, and they came up this track. And uh, you can see there's a German bunker there. This is the Battle of Combray, with over 200 tanks. Again, lots of mechanical failures. We took ground, we lost it again a few days later. A familiar story of the First World War. It was easy enough to break through the enemy lines. What was very difficult was then to break out and get any further. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, we have Lawrence of Arabia. Policy out in the Middle East is deliberately to try and get rid of the Ottoman Empire, to destabilize it. And it was decided that one of the ways of doing this was by encouraging the Arabs to rise up against their Turkish rulers in Saudi Arabia. And the promise that was made, and the vision that was made, was a pan-Arab state that would consist of Saudi Arabia, Palestine, what is modern Syria, and modern Iraq. And now, of course, it's rather interesting. We've got ISIS, IS, who are trying to do the same thing. But this particular place is Beersheba, and in fact, in October 1917, the Australian Light Horse Cavalry did, they charged across here and they took the city of Beersheba, 
and I went out there to photograph the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, and I wanted to get a picture of the battle, and I'm told, I look at it, and this is a hill here called Tel El Saba, which the Turks have fortified, and I go there to photograph it, and I discover it is a UNESCO site. The reason it's a UNESCO site is that it was first fortified in 9,500 BC. So, 9,500 BC, it's 45. I try to get a picture, I come along this ridge here, and I find myself in a series of gun pits. Turkish gun pits. Because this is where the Turkish artillery was. So this piece of ground, and I'd, lo I'd love to find out from someone else whether it is somewhere else, another place in the world, but you have, there is here is proof of 11,000 years of warfare on this particular piece of ground. So for me, it's a rather unusual piece of ground. I'm just going to speed on because I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, in, actually, I will go back to this. Because what happens in uh, 1918, Jeremy referred to this, the Germans launch a last-ditch assault. Russia has collapsed. They've signed a peace treaty. The Germans suddenly have about 100 divisions that they can actually move to the Western Front, and they decide to make this last-ditch attack. Here's the Western Front as it's been for, for most of the war, and they launch this assault here and here. And it's very successful. They make a lot of ground, uh, but at a place called Villas Bretano, the Australians, and for, the Australians, we all know about the Australians at Gallipoli because they talk a lot about it, um, and they have Anzac Day. It's interesting to note that, in fact, the French lost more men at Gallipoli than did the Australians. But here at Villas Bretano, this is where the Australians came in and they held the German attack in, beginning in, in, in March of 1918. And um, this is where the balance of war begins to change. The Germans have had this huge gamble. Um, there are, are accounts of the German soldiers being horrified by the quality of the supply stores that they were finding, that the, that, that the Allies had abandoned in their retreat. They could not believe the quality of what they were finding because by this time Germany is suffering. Um, there's a, I, I got a description where a man is complaining that the belts for the machine gun ammunition are made out of paper. And if it rains, he can't fire his machine gun because the paper falls apart. And it's during this massive German assault that the long-awaited Americans come into the war. It's often said, oh, they took too long to come. But we took 18 months between 1914 and the Somme in 1916 to put an army into the field. The Americans had a huge problem. In, when they declared war in 1917, their army was only about 125,000 men. They were not a nation. 30% of the American army that was drafted was first-generation immigrants. There was a problem of linguistics. A lot of these people did not speak English as their native tongue. And you would also have the anomaly of young German emigrant, immigrants being then sent back to Europe to fight against the country from which they emigrated. Extraordinary thought. This is Bella Wood. This is where the United States Marine Corps first went into action. And this is where they had a very bad day at the office. Because in this field, they lost over a 1,000 men. They just attacked across the field towards that wood and got completely chewed up. They lost more men in this field than they'd lost in their entire previous history. An extraordinary day. But uh, the... They proceeded to take the wood. It took them a month, but they were very, very tenacious fighters, um, as the Germans were very quick to acknowledge. They didn't think much of American tactics, but they thought the American soldier was actually a pretty bloody-minded character um, and didn't really know how to go up. The, German, the Americans then went on into Meuse-Argonne, where they mounted a huge uh, offensive. And this is actually the biggest American battlefield ever. They put more men onto this ground battlefield than any other campaign in the history. 1.2 million men. And it's a battle the Americans have forgotten about. If you ask any American what's hit the biggest battle they've ever fought, you'll say, we'll probably Gettysburg. Other countries, Italy. This is the Italian campaign, which was a vertical war as much as horizontal. 
This is up in the Dolomites, and this is the supply route that they had to use to get men and munitions up onto the mountain. Just imagine doing that in winter. Extraordinary. Um, our view of the Italian military, if you like, is generally coloured by their performance in the Second World War, because most military history is written by people who remember that. In the First World War, they were very badly led, but they were incredibly tenacious fighters, the Italians, and I don't think they should ever be underestimated. Um, and this again is that this is the kind of terrain in which they were fighting. Quite, quite extraordinary, incredibly rugged. And this particular position, to get to it, it's about four hours from the road. Everything would have to be carried up here. Water, ammunition, the lot. It was a very, very hard campaign to fight. Um, this is where Wilfred Owen died. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit controversial here because seeing as I've been invited here by the English department and I know um, the connections with Owen and things like that, he is an incredibly influential person in our thinking about the First World War because he is a very powerful writer and I think by anybody's standards he is a great poet. But I would suggest to you that we need not to discount what he says, but we really should say to ourselves, why, just because he writes beautiful English, should we take his views about the war more seriously than anybody else's? And we do tend to think, to base a lot of our thinking on poetry. And a poet, I think, by definition, is probably someone who's going to be a bit more unsettled by war than a lot of people. And there are an awful lot of contemporary writings, which basically, by young men saying, well, actually, we did a good job. I was 18 years old in August 1914. i just left Winchester and was to have gone up to Christchurch in October. Within a fortnight, I was gazetted to the 4th Battalion Ox and Bucks Light Infantry. For my part, I have to confess that I look back on the years 1914 to 18 as amongst the happiest I have ever spent that they contain moments of boredom and depression, of sorrow for the loss of friends, and of alarm for my personal safety is indeed true enough. But to be perfectly fit, to live amongst pleasant companions, to have responsibility and a clearly defined job, these are great compensations when one is very young. Now maybe not the greatest of words, but I think that we do, we do him and many of his comrades a disservice if we ignored what he says as opposed to what maybe Wilfred Owen would have said at the same time. Now, Africa is another place that we completely forget about. And I think this is really very, very unfortunate because it's, one, it's a huge colonial blot it is estimated that about one million Africans died in the campaign out here. They were used as porters, they died of sickness, they died of the in Spanish influenza, they died of famine. And it was all down in this area here. There was an extraordinary man called Clue Le a German. He had 3,000 German troops and about 18,000 native troops or Ascaris. And he actually tied up about 800,000 Allied men. We had an army out there. We had porters. And he fought a campaign for four years. I think he's probably one of the great guerrilla fighters of all time because he was basically living off British supplies. He was cut off. The Germans couldn't resupply him. And he lived off the supplies he captured from the British. And one of, this is one of the traces of the war out there. This is a 1940... We talk about... High Speed 2 is going to take till about 2028 to build. We built 70 miles of rail track in three months, and it was in use until 15 years ago. This was a track which was built to get the British Army to the front. Um, and really, that is a look. Yes, I, it is not just quite four o'clock. Fields of battle, lands of peace. And I'm going to leave you with the words of a veteran, P.J. Campbell, who wrote... No, they would not be lonely. There were too many of them. I saw that bare country before me, the miles and miles of torn earth, the barbed wire, the litter, the dead trees. But the country would come back to life, the grass would grow again, the wildflowers would turn, and trees where now there were only splintered skeleton stumps. They would lie still and at peace below the singing larks, beside the serenely flowing rivers. 
they could not feel lonely. They would have one another. And they would have us also. We belong to them, and they would be part of us forever. And I think as we come up for the next four years, I think there's a great worse. Because I think if we go around saying, oh, the war was terrible, it was totally pointless, all those men died for no reason, I think we do them a disservice. I think we have to remember them with pride. And I think we have to look forward and learn the lessons of the First World War. Because after all, most of us have been incredibly lucky. We've never been involved in a war. And to look forward to that and reflect on that, that time and nature have actually made these places of horror and death really rather beautiful places. And sometimes people say to me, well, when you're standing on a battlefield, don't you feel sorry? I say, well, actually, if you didn't tell me it was a battlefield, I'd probably be saying, what a lovely place this is. And that's what I like to think my photographs are showing, is that these places of horror have today become places of beauty and tranquility. Thank you very much.